So we are continuing with our series um, of the Gospel of Luke. Um, I'm not going to rehash the last two weeks. Chris preached. It was absolutely brilliant. I encourage you to read, uh, not read, watch those um, online. Okay, but for today. So over 2,000 years ago, a synagogue-going carpenter got up out of where he was sitting. He was handed a scroll. He unrolled it, and he read these words. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. I mean, that's, that's enough, isn't it? <laughs> that's good enough. I could just sit down now. In doing so, he told everyone at the synagogue who he was that day and who he had come for. Such was the shock, the revelation of his words, the compassion, the power, the authority, the comfort, and the love that those words came with, that his message was handed down through the generations, till finally many of us sitting in this room heard those words. And those words have changed our lives forever, finding out who he was and what he's come to do. One man, full of the Spirit, stating who he was. One son, knowing exactly what he had come here to do. Let's read what happened in Luke 4. Then Jesus returned to Galilee, filled with the Holy Spirit's power. Reports about him spread quickly through the whole region. He taught regularly in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to the village of Nazareth, his boyhood home, he went as usual to the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read the scriptures. The scroll of Isaiah the prophet was handed to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where this was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favour has come. He rolled up the scroll, handed it back to the attendant, and sat down. All eyes in the synagogue looked at him intensely. Then he began to speak to them. The scripture you've just heard has been fulfilled this very day. Everybody spoke well of him and was amazed by the gracious words that came from his lips. How can this be, they asked. Isn't he Joseph's son? Then he said, you will undoubtedly quote me this proverb. Physician, heal yourself. Meaning, do miracles here in your hometown. Sorry, do miracles here in your hometown like those you did in Capernaum. But I tell you the truth, no prophet is accepted in his own hometown. Certainly there were many needy widows in Israel in Elijah's time, when the heavens were closed for three and a half years and a severe famine devastated the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them. He was sent instead to a foreigner, a widow of Zarephath in the land of Sidon. And many in Israel had leprosy in the time of the prophet Elisha, but the only one healed was Naaman, a Syrian. When they heard this, the people in the synagogue were furious. Jumping up, they mobbed him and forced him to the edge of the hill on which the town was built. They intended to push him over the cliff, but he passed right through the crowd and went on his way. So the plan for today. We are going to go through this story, and we're going to see what we can learn from it in terms of what Jesus said and what he did, and in terms of his mission and how that mission, that mission applies to us and how we can learn to be more like him and follow in his footsteps. So we are going to... Oh, can you move it on for me, sorry? Learn how we can be more like Jesus. So we be like Jesus in terms of proximity to the poor. We're going to think about how we can be present, how we can be like Jesus in terms of comfort and controversy, how sometimes that will mean being awkward, and how we can be like Jesus, valuing faith and faithfulness. Be faithful. A good portion of Jesus' ministry unfolded 
in not the most glamorous area. Okay, it was in the undeve underdeveloped province of Galilee, just north of Palestine. It was a place that some commentators describe as abandoned and impoverished. So wouldn't have been on right move for somewhere particularly glamorous to go and buy your house. No one was longing to move there. It was a bit of a backwater. I've resisted the temptation to try and compare it to different places in case there's somebody that lives in that place today. <laughs> so I'm being very safe. But it was, wasn't the best. Uh, it was a largely Gentile area. But there was, in this Gentile area, there were small kind of groups of Jews that were very serious Jews. They were serious. They were dedicated. They were surrounded by Gentiles. So why did Jesus focus on such a, I don't want to say rubbish, such an unglamorous, abandoned and impoverished um, area? Surely it would be better for him to have spent his time in a more kind of salubrious place, a place where there were people that had power, influence, maybe a place like Jerusalem where his message might have spread about quicker. But Jesus opted for Galilee because he was going to start his ministry and carry it out among the masses of forgotten people, because it was a region of people that actually the people in power and, and the religious people had largely forgotten. So he was starting it there. I want you to whiz forward in your minds over 2,000 years to the lovely Aylesbury estate. <laughs> yeah, you know I love to talk about the Aylesbury estate. <laughs> it's just the other side of the Old Kent Road. Okay, in 1997, many of you won't remember this, but I do, Tony Blair visited, oh, he gets a cheer from a few people on the front, right? <laughs> Tony Blair visited this estate, and he made his first speech there, okay? The same day that Tony Blair was there, there was also a very happy team of city hopers on the estate as well. Whoa there we were. So there was myself and Les Watkins, I think, and some others. And we were very busy uh, running a kids' club, a bit like a Sunday school. We were putting custard pies in each other's faces, stuffing marshmallows, eating shoelaces, all while telling Bible stories and teaching memory verses to children trying to remind these kids that actually they were loved and not forgotten. Now, we were there on the estate. One of my road sweeper friends, Pete, came over and said, Oi, Tony Blair's on your block. And I, I didn't believe him. And so I wasn't going to leave the kids' club, that was for sure, until I watched the news that night and saw that he had, in fact, been there. Now, Tony talked in quite a bit of length about the troubles of people on the estate, and, and other estates like it in the country, and talked about them as the forgotten people, maybe without hope, and how his government was going to bring some change. Now, I'm not here to make a political point today. Um, I didn't actually see Tony on the estate again, but I did know, you know, that God hasn't forgotten those children. Those children at that club heard about Jesus week after week after week for years. He had not forgotten them. Now, until last week... This is the grace of God. In my sermon notes, it said, I trust that he is still moving in their lives today. However, this time last week, after the meeting, I was tapped on the shoulder by a young man who said, do you remember me? He was one of the kids from the kids' club. I don't know if he's here today. Femi, are you here? He is here. I'm going to embarrass you. Stand up. <laughs> I know. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Living, breathing proof that Jesus does not forget. Amen. He does not forget. Amen. My point is this, Jesus does not change. Okay? He started his ministry in a place where people were poor and maybe forgotten. And he continues that ministry today through us if we will follow him to those places. He is so good. He is so faithful. You know, Jesus did not feel the need to position himself in important places, and neither should we. Now, I'm not denying that God will call some of us very specifically to, to places of power, to places where people are, are rich and have influence. I don't want to, you know, deny that because God speaks to people and moves them to those places, but not all of us. And for some of us, there may be a case that we need to position ourselves or reposition ourselves amongst those that are not just physically poor, but spiritually poor as well, if we want to see him move. 
Some of us, and myself included, some of us, we just need to be present with those that are sicker, less spiritually well, less healthy than ourselves, that are poorer in some way. It's not a great friend advert. You don't really usually say, see that, do you? Wanted. Friends that are sicker, poorer, listen, live in a less nice area than myself. But actually, sometimes God wants to reposition us in some of those places. There may be people here that he wants to do that with today. Some of us, it's a bit challenging, but some of us actually just have too many friends that are really rich. And again, I'm not just talking about money, although some of you are probably thinking, I wish I did have some friends that were rich. They could buy me a drink on a Friday night and take me for a little walk around Waitrose. But no, (laughs) some of us do need to be with people that aren't so rich in terms of spiritual. You know, it's very easy. You come to a beautiful church like City Hope, and suddenly you find yourself surrounding yourself with people that are Christians all the time because we're all so lovely and it's nice hanging out. But actually, we need to be with those that are spiritually, spiritually poor. We need to be like Jesus, be present and have a proximity to the poor. We also need to be like Jesus. This isn't going to be such a fun one in terms of comfort and controversy. Or controversy? Contra- co- controversy. Controversy, yes. Be awkward, just like that was. Be awkward. <laughs> so if you had to get up, Jesus obviously got up and made the statement about who he was. If you had to get up today and make a statement telling the world who you were, how would you do it? Maybe you might not have a synagogue to go to. Maybe you would have Twitter. So we are going to play a little game. This game is called Guess the Twitter Status. So these people are in the room. I apologize if you're not from City Hope because you will have no idea what I'm talking about now, no idea who they are. But if you are this person, please don't raise your hand. We want everyone to guess first. So we'll start with the first one, guess the Twitter status. This person works and worships at City Hope London, blessed with a wonderful family. I don't know how to pronounce that word, but I do know what it means because I looked it up. They are also an MA student. Who is this person? Does anybody know? Paul and Denise know. It's Rebecca Whittaker. He's not here today, unfortunately, so you can give a round of applause, but she won't hear you. <laughs> Rebecca Whittaker. It means wine expert. Oh, yeah, I don't know how to pronounce it, but it does mean wine because I looked it up. In case it meant something that wasn't very good, I didn't want to put it up. Uh, Okay, now this one, I have to say, I have changed the names of the people in it, because otherwise it's too obvious, okay, because I don't want you to get it too quickly. Husband to Kath, father to Heather, they all begin with the right letters. John and Jennifer, member of the Excellent City Hope Church in the Excellent London IT Manager and Occasional Developer. I can pronounce all those words, perfect. Right. Stephen Piggott, well done, yeah. Okay, do you want one more? You're enjoying this game, yeah, we will get on to more of the Bible in a minute, last one. Contemporary women's wear designer based in East London, specialising in creative cutting construction using luxury fabrication, uh-huh. made in London. Dan, do you notice, as I was going through, I thought, I'm his wife, by the way. Um, he doesn't mention his lovely family or beautiful wife in his one. <laughs> the other two, both, I've got a wonderful family. Da, da, da. I am with Daniel Plate trousers, if anybody wants to buy me at the end. <sighs> okay, so let's get serious. Jesus, for Jesus, clearly, Twitter, fortunately, wasn't available. So he didn't use Twitter to announce to the world who he was. Instead, he used a prophecy from an Old Testament prophet we can go over it again. He, I'll remind you of what he said. The spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that the captives will be released and the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. Oh, don't want that one, sorry. He rolled up the scroll and handed it back to the, the attendant and said, this scripture you've just heard has been fulfilled this very day. So a few things I'd like you to bear in mind in terms of him getting up and saying this. Firstly, the people that he was saying it to were very familiar with this passage. Okay, It wasn't new to them. It wasn't like, oh, we've never heard this before. They would have known about the prophecy and they would have heard it. Secondly, the people that he's spoken to were oppressed. Okay, So they 
loved this passage. They thought it was a wonderful passage, and they would have seen it quite through, like, through political eyes. Okay? It would be kind of like, yeah, throw off the Roman oppressor. Hooray! Okay, so they might have seen it a bit differently than us. Lastly, the people listening were Jews, okay? and they had been waiting a long time for this Messiah to come, for the prophecy to be fulfilled. And Jesus is saying, you don't need to wait any longer. Your wait is over. I am the Messiah. This is who I am. Wait over. So you would think that they would be really happy about this, wouldn't you? You'd think they'd be delighted. Hooray, the Messiah has come. So why are they so angry? You see how it ends. They try to kill him. They're not pleased. Okay. Was it because... I mean, initially I read it and I thought, it's because it's Joseph's son saying this, and they're just like, who do you think you are? Maybe there was some of that. But actually, it seems like, as you read into the passage, it was much more than that. It's not what Jesus read that day. It's what he missed out. Okay. So the, sl- the, the original text, the original prophecy, is a little bit different to the one that he reads. So you can see here... This is the one that I read. This is the one that he said, okay? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And it ends with, and the time of the Lord's favor has come. But the original that Isaiah would have prophesied, it says, and with it, the day of God's anger against their enemies. He has sent me to tell to tell those who mourn that the time of the Lord's favour has come, and with it, the day. So there's vengeance in the second one. There's not in the first. So why do they not like it? They don't like it because they, he's missed out their favourite bit. They want the vengeance on the enemies. They want vengeance on those that are non-Jews. It was their favourite bit. You know, some things just naturally go together, don't they? If you're into the finer things of life, you know, you might have wine and then if a certain cheese doesn't come out, you're really disappointed because the wine and the cheese, they just marry so beautifully together. If you're not quite so into the finer things of life and you shop at Lidl like me, imagine going to Lidl, walking in and finding they've taken away the middle aisle. I mean, what is the point of going to Lidl without the middle aisle? The best bit has been missed out. So they would have been feeling a bit like that, but obviously much, much worse and much more spiritually significant, okay? So it's one favorite bit missing. The vengeance was missing from the text. Jesus is saying to them, this is who I am. I am a Messiah for the Jews, but I'm a Messiah and Savior for the non-Jews too. It's not freedom for the Jews and vengeance for the Gentiles. He's saying, I am here to rescue everybody. And they did not like it. He turns a text of judgment into a text of mercy. And it is awkward and it's controversial and it is not what those people wanted to hear. He wasn't put off by their disapproving stares because he actually goes on and he says... Then he said, you are undoubtedly, quote me, this proverb, physician, heal yourself, meaning do miracles here in your hometown like those you did in Capernaum. But I tell you the truth, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. They want him to put Nazareth where they are first. And they want him to minister there and minister to them. But he doesn't say he will. Instead, he reminds them of two stories of their favorite prophets. Where, they, where, touching people, where, where God is touching people that were not Jews. So it speaks of God's inclusive heart. Again, it's saying, he's saying everybody is invited. And it makes people angry because the people are racist, quite frankly, and self-important. They are angry because they want a national saviour. And Jesus is there standing very much in the case of, no, I am an international saviour. I am here for all. He spoke out and the whole thing was so awkward, so controversial. The question for us is, we want to be like Jesus. Will we follow him there? You know, there were eight attempts made on Jesus' life that we can read of in the New Testament. Do we really want to be like him? In a world that says only do stuff when it feels good, do we want to bring the fullness of his message? Jesus' message is one of massive, massive comfort. It really is. It's good news. It's setting captives free. But it's also one of controversy. If our message is 
only comfort and no controversy, then we maybe need to ask him to help us to bring the full message. You know, a few years ago, myself and my husband were really, really fortunate to go to Morocco. We were celebrating our 10-year wedding anniversary, and we went out in the day, and then in the evening we'd be in this place where you eat all together with, with uh, a whole bunch of people. And um, it'd be funny because we'd talk about our days, and usually they were quite fit, all the other people there, and they'd go, oh, today, you know, we climbed up three mountains, we spoke in the local dialect, and we drank water fresh from the stream somewhere. And then Dan and I would be like, oh, what did we do? We uh, went to market, <laughs> we ate kebabs, <laughs> ate some more kebabs, and then we took the bus home. <laughs> and uh, but we still, you know, we got on okay with the people in spite of our differences. Anyway, there was one night when we were chatting, and um, it got a bit deep. And one of the guys says, I don't know where it came from, but he said, no one believes in life after death these days, do they? And there were some very approving nods and grunts from everybody around. And there was, you know, there was a crowd. And they were like, no, no, no one believes that. No, why would anyone believe that? And you're just sat there like, oh, no. Let's go back to talking about how many mountains you've climbed. <laughs> and, um, but Dan boldly you know, said, well, actually, we do. And I can't remember all the details of the conversation. I don't want to make stuff up. But basically, we were then able to really share with the people in that group. And the conversation was really good. And they, to be honest, they asked us some questions we didn't have answers to at times. But we were able to share our faith and just talk about how good God had been and what he does. But it was awkward. You know, that beginning bit was really awkward. We kind of were like, ooh, because we, we were in a room full of people that didn't really agree and thought some of our views were a bit silly. Sometimes we need to bring both. And you can, we can box ourselves, can't we? I know that I sometimes do this. You can say, well, Claire, actually, I'm much more of a comfort person. You know, I like to do the kind of servant evangelism. I like to kind of be comforting to people and listen to people. I really don't really want to do that kind of go out on the street like Dan and the team do and kind of approach strangers. And I found myself do that myself. Honestly, I do that. I'm like, no, Dan, I'll do this. I'm over here on the Aylesbury. You go with your street team praying for people. I really don't. I find that quite awkward. I don't really like it. But actually, Jesus has called us to do both. You know, sometimes he does call us to say things that other people don't agree with and just to bring truth in, even though it makes us feel silly, but just to bring truth. And I would challenge you this month to try and do the thing that you find least comfortable. So if you find it really difficult chatting to people that need comfort and, and, yeah, and being God's love in that way, then maybe find somebody at work that you know has gone through a difficult time, you haven't really spoken to them about it, go and offer to pray for them or speak with them or comfort them. Or maybe go to Food Bank and listen to some people's stories from there and just be able to bring comfort. If, however, you feel like it's bringing words and of kind of that might make things quite awkward and you know, being more like on the street like Dan and his team do where they go out and they pray for random strangers, if you find that's the thing, that's going to be difficult for you. In a way, I'd say go and do that because it's good to really have to cry out to God to help us. You know, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on us for these things. We need to feel the need for the spirit and not just to do things always that our natural gifting lends us to. Does that make sense? Yeah? Do the one you can't do in your own strength, the one that feels most awkward. It's good to rely on the spirit of the sovereign Lord being upon us, not on our own gifting. Be like Jesus. Value faith and faithfulness. The widow in the story, so he mentions these two stories, would have assumed that the God of Israel was powerless in her district. But she made a huge leap of faith by giving up her bread, and the story is remembered because she was a model of faith that day. That's also what Jesus did then and what he does now. He values faith and faithfulness when he sees it. And I want to remind us of that, because I really felt when I was preparing this, that there are people in this room that kind of think are going to be thinking, Claire, I have done all of that. I've brought comfort to people. I've spoken words in awkward situations. I've done that year after year. I've nailed my colours to the mask, but I've not seen anything. I've not seen salvation. I've not seen miracles. And I've just ended up quite tired. But do you know what? In the two stories that Jesus talks about, he commends their peop- the people for their faith, for trusting God. 
not for doing the miracles. Okay? The miracles are up to God. Salvation is up to God. He wants our faith and he wants our trust. And actually, if you feel like that, oh, I've done it and now I'm exhausted, he would commend you in the same way today. He sees how you have stepped out in faith and he is pleased with you. He brings a message of mercy, not judgment to you today. He's not judging you for not seeing the salvation. He loves your faithfulness. You can keep going. It's not about us, is it? It's about his spirit being on us to bring good news. You're wondering what this blanket is here for. It's not a towel. It's high quality from Aldi's, Chris. (laughs) The middle aisle. Um, No. What is it? It's a blanket. It is. And what do you use a blanket for? To keep warm. Okay? It's comforting. All my three kids have got a blanket. Not this one. They wouldn't let me use it for this. But they've all got a blanket. They sit on the sofa. And it brings them comfort. It keeps them warm. Okay. This is coffee. Oh. It's not working. Oh, God. Oh, no. It's all right. Oh, I know. I like doing something for the Tate Modern. I'm going to make it even worse. <laughs> Bit of mud from my balcony. Yeah. yeah, nice. Okay. But tell me, maybe not quite that much. <laughs> what is this? It's still a blanket. It's a dirty blanket, but it is still a blanket. What can it still do? It can still keep me warm. It can still bring me comfort. Some of us feel like this blanket. Okay? Some of us look at ourselves and we see the mistakes that we've made. We see we're very aware of our sin. We're very aware. We feel a bit tired and at times a bit worn out. Even when we feel like that, we are still, God, we are still God's child. We are still full of the, sov- the spirit of the sovereign Lord ready to bring good news to the poor. It doesn't matter that we don't feel that great all the time. We don't feel super capable for the task of church planting or whatever. We are still who he's called us to be. It's his spirit that we need, not some super efficiency being able to speak well or love well from us, okay? It doesn't change anything. And I really feel that for people, actually, another plug for the church planting meeting. If you're sitting here thinking, I want to go to that meeting, but I don't feel really up for the task. I feel tired. I feel old. I feel like the blanket with the dirt on, I'd say still go. You need to go. You need to go in his strength, not in yours, because his spirit is on you for this mission to bring good news to the poor and to bind up the brokenhearted. Don't go because you're great. Go because you're his. So the challenge. You know, I feel like somehow the enemy has persuaded us that living a life full of the Spirit, this missional view, is like an optional extra. Because when we're tired, it feels sometimes like an optional extra, something we might or might not do, something to do when we feel clean, which isn't often, something to do when we don't have much going on, which isn't that often, something to do when we feel like, oh, we've got loads of time on our hands, which isn't that often, something to do when we feel well-supported, it's not always that often, something to do when... The sermon is really inspiring, which is more often than a lot of you think. But but in a world that says, do you know, in a world that says the good news is you can just be whatever you want to be, we have good news from our king and creator who says, actually, no, this is who I am, and this is who I've called you to be. Now come and follow me. We have to keep going on the mission, bringing good news to the poor, not because we're slaves, but because we are free. And somebody that is free, someone that has been unchained, needs to go around and unchain others. Can the band come up, please? Let's move some of my stuff out of the way so you can actually get to the stage. I'm drawing to a close. I'm going to worship soon. I know you can't wait to worship.
we're going to spend some time worshipping really soon. But I was thinking about responding for today. And uh, there's a couple of kind of groups of people that I thought might want to respond. And you can just do this in your own time as we worship. I'm not going to call anybody out. But obviously, if you need prayer or want prayer, come up or grab the person next to you. For some of us, I think some of us maybe need to repent today. We've had this as a bit of a theme through the last few weeks, hasn't there? There's been a call to repentance. Some of us might need to repent of writing other people off. It might not be whole nations. It might be classes. It might just be the kind of people we don't like. We need to repent of for wanting a Messiah that is for us and just like us and for us alone. Maybe we surround ourselves with people that are just like us, just like Jesus' audience did. Those who come from the same part of the world, those who are rich, and those who are well. Do you know what? The Jewish audience were really familiar with the passage, but they were not happy as Jesus changed a a text, uh, shifts the text from what you will receive to what you are expected to give. Are we sometimes like that with the gospel? We're all right in church. It's nice here. And we're not concerned anymore about people that are different to us, people that maybe live live in less nice places. So some of us need to spend some time just talking to Jesus about that today, just repenting. But there's others, the blanket people, that I feel like need a word of comfort today. We need to respond by just standing and listening to his words of comfort. Those of you that feel tired, those of you that dread reading a gospel like Luke, because actually it'll just make you feel a bit unsuccessful, you just think, I haven't seen all those things. You're tired. You're tired like Jesus was when he was in the boat. You're tired, you're frustrated, frustrated like Jesus was as he knocked all the tables down at the temple. You're becoming more like Jesus. You're becoming more like Jesus as you rely on him. You may have started with high hopes and been disappointed, but he is here to comfort you today and say, you can keep going. You can keep going full of his spirit not because of yourself and your giftings, full of his spirit, you can keep going and you can bring good news to the poor and you can bind up the brokenhearted, just like he did, with him, partnering with him, not trying to do it as a superhero by yourself. And lastly, some of you aren't believers. There'll be people in this room that don't know Jesus today, but you are maybe brokenhearted. You feel maybe you are the poor in spirit, And maybe you feel trapped by some of the mistakes that you've made in your life. I want to encourage you that there is hope for you. Over 2,000 years ago, a synagogue-going carpenter king got up out of his seat and made a speech and then went on to the cross with you very much in mind. He has not forgotten you. He loves you. He wants to rescue you. He wants to set you free. You're not forgotten. If that's you, then please come and speak to, either speak to the person that brought you along, or myself, or anybody else that smiles at you warmly. (laughs) Come and speak to them. Find out some more. Come to Alpha. There's lots of opportunities to find out about how wonderful he is. And for the rest of us, if you're not repenting or seeking comfort, let's just worship him now. Worship the one who came to set us free. Worship the one that came to comfort us, that changed our lives forever, as he spoke all those years ago. We're so glad for everything that he is and everything that he's done. Let's worship.